Now, two months later, I'm up in Big Bear, up in the mountains, training with one of my friends. And, uh, so December. Yeah, December. And uh, specifically, I went home on vacation after I, I lost my fight in November. I went home on vacation, and I was going to spend Christmas, Christmas Eve, New Year's, and New Year's Eve with my family. In but Oregon? I get, yeah, in Oregon. Okay. But I get a phone call, and uh, I get a phone call, uh, like maybe December 18th or 20th, from my friend in Orange County. He's fighting in the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and he says, I need you to miss those vacations and fly back, you know, and I need you, you're going to miss Christmas Eve. And I said, bro, when, what day do you want me back? He says, can you come back on the 23rd? So I went ahead and changed my plane ticket, which was going to be like January 4th. I changed it to December 23rd. Thank God, you know, somehow it happened on the exact date. And it was perfect for me because Raphael, un unbeknownst to me, had followed through with this idiotic plan of his mm -hmm. and uh, had, had killed Brian Richardson on the 21st or the 22nd, okay. you know. So I fly back on the 23rd and uh, we go straight to the mountains and I'm training and I get a phone call. Maybe uh, We as who? Uh, my friend Chris Brennan okay. and I. Yeah, the guy in Orange County, my okay. trainer in Orange County. And that name will come up again, Chris Brennan. So Chris Brennan gets a phone call on his cell phone. He said, hey, you know, it's, it's Raphael for you. And we're in a sushi bar up in Big Bear. And the date would have been maybe a January, you know, maybe December, you know, 30th or January 1st or 2nd, you know, because okay. I believe he fought maybe January 10th. Okay. So, the f so Brian Richardson's already been murdered. And, uh, and Raphael's done it, and I had no idea. And I get a phone call, and it's Raphael. And he has this, this uh, weird story, like, you won't believe it, Gerald. Somebody killed Brian Richardson. Brian Richardson's been murdered. And I just about threw the phone. I knew right away this idiot has gone through with this stupid plan of his, you know. And, and he had, uh, I, I had no idea how it happened or what had happened, but his story right then, because he thought his phone was being tapped, was, yeah, isn't that crazy? Somebody killed Brian Richardson. And I'm not stupid. I know this follows right through with the plan he had described to me a couple months prior. Right. So now I'm in a situation like, okay, he's asked me specifically if I would do this. I'm probably the only guy that knows, you know, that he had this planned or was even a thought in his mind. So now I'm thinking, oh, no, now he's going to want to come up to Big Bear and train with us, you know, and talk to me. I just, I just wanted to be away from this guy. And usually homicides are solved, you know, relatively fast. So I thought by the time he said that the detectives had already come and questioned him and questioned Angel, so I thought, okay, it's just a matter of weeks. You know, he's a complete fool. It's just a matter of weeks until they, they just arrest him and he goes up. Well, it didn't happen. And we came back from the UFC, you know, it went down maybe January 10th. He hadn't been arrested. So uh, I'm back in Orange County living inside the facility I'm training at. And I get a call like maybe mid-January from Raphael. Hey, I need to come down and talk to you. And I know exactly, you know, what, what it means. He's, he, you know, he did it. He's coming down to, you know, discuss with me, you know, what happened or how he needs me. Or maybe he's coming down to kill me. I don't know. I'm right now basically a liability because I knew, you know, this was a, a scheme of his. So I, I try to put it off. I try to postpone it, but there's no way. He came down. He, uh, he met me. He wanted to meet me in the parking lot of, a, of uh, Krispy Kremes in Orange County or Lake Forest. And right behind the parking lot is a little uh, forested wood area right by the freeway. Uh -huh. You know, there's homeless people sleeping back there. It's a really, you know, enclosed area nobody can see or really hear with cars zinging by what's going on back there. And I'm panicked. I don't know if he's going to shoot me on the spot. He shows up in Brian Richardson's white, I believe, Chevy work truck, and he's wearing a leather jacket that comes down, you know, past his, his quads. I don't know if he has a shotgun or a whatever, and I'm just, I, I just think, you know what? I've never done this guy wrong by anything, you know? He, I hopefully, he, hopefully he's not going to kill me. Right. So we go behind the Krispy Kremes, and he goes, you know, Gerald, uh, you know, and he starts shaking, and he's got tears in his eyes, and he tells me what happened. He tells me a story about, uh, he tells me that he was in his school late at night, and he was cleaning. Where's the school at? The school was in Rancho Cucamonga at this time, okay. somewhere off of Baseline and something. But uh, so he tells me this story that he's in his room, his school, cleaning late at night, and uh, he gets a phone call, and it's Brian Richardson. And Brian says to him, uh, and I remember this stuff pretty clearly because this has been on my mind for two years now. He says, uh, hey, I need to speak with you. You know, I'm going to come down to the school. And Raphael said, well, hurry up. You only have a few minutes. You know, what do you need? And Brian said, well, I want to speak to you in person. So Brian came down to his school, and he walked in, and Raphael was finishing up his sweeping. And uh, Brian Richardson said, you know, I know you've been sleeping with my wife. And Brian Richardson tried to get him to admit, you know, I know you've had, been having an affair with Angel. And Raphael, you know, said, what the F are you talking about? You know, I, you know, tried to play tough guy with him. And Brian Richardson pulled out a Glock. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's known to have this Glock 45. He's always told, all, told us all, of, all the cool weapons he has. So Raphael said he pulled out his Glock 45 and pointed it in Raphael's face. 
He's like, you can either, you know, go out like a bitch or you can tell me, you know, what happened and go out like a man and take it like a man because either way, I'm going to kill you. This is Raphael's story. And uh, Raphael said that uh, he pretended, you know, or he, he started crying and, and pretended like he was trying to talk to Brian. Like, listen, I, I haven't had an, I, I stopped. I haven't seen her in, in weeks. You know, we quit. You know, we're done. Yes, we had an affair, but it's over. And then in the midst of Raphael talking, he says he knocked the gun out of Brian Richardson's hand and it slid across the mats. And he said that both him and Brian tried to jump for the gun. Brian landed on it closer to him. And Raphael jumped on his back. And Raphael told me that he put in a rear choke, you know, which is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu move. And it's called, uh, in Portuguese, kill the lion. It's called Mata Leon. He says he put the rear choke on him just to choke him unconscious because you can choke a man unconscious and let him go and he's still fine. But he said that uh, he panicked and squeezed too hard and he felt something in Brian's throat crush, you know. And, and he panicked and he held the choke too long because he was scared. And he said when he let go and he, and he went to see if Brian was still alive, that he was dead and there was blood coming out of his mouth. So now he said this was, it was an accident, it was a big mistake, and uh, he was just trying to protect himself. His self-defense was his story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a lot to hit me with, you know. So now I have a lot of things in my mind. First of all, I know Raphael doesn't clean his school late at night. You know, I know uh, that's a lie. You know, right. I used to sweep the school. And uh, I know that, you know, there's going to be fingerprints and evidence and all kinds of little DNA problems that are going to ruin the story. And uh, Raphael said, well, yeah. Um, I can't go to the police with this. I, I, I don't want to do 10 or 15 or 20 years or for whatever for manslaughter or, or murder in whatever degree. He goes, so what I did is I, I cleaned the blood off the mat with, uh, with some sort of disinfectant. He put Brian in the back of his own pickup and he wrapped the Glock up in a t-shirt that he had, uh, a tap out t-shirt that he had at the, the school or whatever. Maybe it was on him, but he wrapped it up in a t-shirt and uh, he put Brian in the back of his truck, took the Glock with him and drove Brian's truck to the front of a, a cardio fit gym it's like a couple miles or a mile from the place and he just ditched the truck in the parking lot mm -hmm. and then I, apparently uh, he told me he, he ran back to the school and got his vehicle from there and, and went on his way but uh, he smokes cigarettes he can't run you know right. he's completely out of shape so maybe at that point I, I'm thinking okay for sure he murdered this guy because I asked him I asked him uh, well what about fingerprints he said no don't worry I, I wore gloves so I'm thinking, you don't just sweep your floor with gloves on. You're a fool. Right. But I don't want to let him know that I know he just cold-blooded murdered this guy. So, okay, okay. I just pretended, like, okay, like I didn't even catch it. And uh, for him to run back to the school, you know, makes me think, you know, maybe he had a ride. You know, I, I don't think he could run a mile in an hour. So I just, right. I've seen all these holes in his story, but I don't want to let him on to believe that. So I say, okay, um, uh, that's horrible. You know, what, what, do you, what do you need from me? What did you call me out here for? And I know why he called me. I'm the only guy who knew that he was planning this. So he said, well, what I need from you is this Glock 21 is the only thing that can corroborate my story. And uh, it has my fingerprints on it and Brian's fingerprints on it. And uh, I need you to hold on to this for me. And if I get arrested, I need you to come forward with this handgun and tell my story because I don't want to get life in prison over this. I want, you know, at that point, it's better if I come forward with this story and maybe I'll get manslaughter or whatever and get 10 years. So this is going to corroborate his self-defense story. That was the reason he wanted me to hold on to this gun. Right. So he has left so much evidence and clues that it's an easy case. He gets, he goes down for whatever he did, and he goes away to prison. And then I can just live my life. I don't have to worry about him coming back and killing me because I never double-crossed him. I did everything he asked me to do with this gun. You know, I never told him he killed. I never told anybody that he killed the guy. Then he should have no reason to come back on me. Right. I know my only other option is to come forward with this gun. You know which is going to be a direct, you know, arrest for him and all that, then I've crossed the man who's already killed somebody. Right. So I'm in this situation, so I waited. And uh, Raphael had never, now we'll go back to the loan I paid Raphael. He'd never paid me any money. All of a sudden, you know, I'm holding this gun for him, trying to do my own thing. All of a sudden I get a phone call, Gerald, I have a couple thousand dollars I want to pay you. And, uh, you know, where, where can I come to Hollywood and give it to you? You know, now he wants to pay back the loan that he gave me that he hasn't paid me on in, I don't know, a year and a half, not one payment. Right. So I know, okay, this guy's, you know, he's panicking. He's, he really thinks that, you know, I'm his only loose end. I realize, you know, he would not pay back, pay back that loan unless he felt obligated to because I had something over his head. So he pays me his $2,000, and he starts paying $100 a month, $100 every couple weeks. He's spontaneously giving me money. Did you ever tell him to pay you money or you would go to the Never, police? never. Okay. I was scared. Okay. I was scared. So never, I just, and I even told him every time he'd pay me money, I would thank him. Like he was doing me a favor right. when in all reality, he's just giving me, giving me back my money. But I never wanted him to feel like I was trying to hold that gun above his head because I for sure would be dead. I would, I thought, right. I would think. 
So I just played cool. I was basically just an actor pretending like I, you know, okay, I'm on your side. And the whole time I'm just praying, okay, they're just working on a case. You know, they aren't going to rush anything. They're going to be thorough and it's going to happen. And then I, I won't have to be involved. I won't have to double cross this guy. But it didn't happen. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know what? I need to get out of L.A. He, know, he knew where I lived and he, knew, he knows where my parents live and where my brother lives. So I, I felt too vulnerable in L.A. I had a very good life there. I lived on my friend's couch for no rent trained at will and fought whenever I wanted and all the money I made from fighting was spending money I didn't have any bills so I was living the high life but what I did is I I went ahead and applied for a passport and uh, I told Rafael I'm going to Hungary you know he has no idea how to get around Hungary much less the capital of Budapest so I moved to Budapest Hungary and I was there for over six months and uh, it, during, during that six months I was just just buying myself time hopefully you know the six months will be enough time for them to catch him hopefully but we're pushing maybe a year and a half after the murder now by the time I came back from Hungary and uh, still no arrest, still no serious evidence. So I come back, at this point, uh, the Glock, I'm still holding this gun for him up in Oregon, you know. I come back and I'm debating what am I gonna do, you know, I mean, at this point, I'm in so deep, you know, if I, if I just have no, really no options, you know. So I waited a few more months and uh, Raphael called me maybe a couple months ago or a month ago and he said, hey, you know, it looks like the, the criminal uh, case against me is going nowhere. They don't have enough evidence. However, the civil trial is going to fuck me. That's what he says. A civil trial, the family's suing me civilly. I've just been served and I went to the arbitration. I'm being sued for wrongful death, I believe, just like the O.J. Simpson fiasco. That's right. the only thing I understood it. And he said that, you know, everything looks good for the criminal trial. If they had anything, they would have come forward and arrested me, so they don't. So the civil trial is going to swamp me. They could sue me for all the money I ever owned for the rest of my life, basically a million dollars or whatever. So, uh, so he said, you know what, and uh, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. You know, I had to just pay $3,000 for an attorney, and uh, what's going to happen if, if I have to pay him all the money for the rest of my life? He's like, fuck that. I'm going to, you know, he's been to Thailand a lot of times. He's been to Holland a lot of times. He's been to Japan. And I, I could tell you all the connections he has in some of these places. Right. But uh, so he's made various trips there, and he's very comfortable in these countries. So he goes, uh, if they find me guilty in this, uh, in this civil suit, I'm just going to move to Thailand and open a business there. I can't deal with it. You know, I'm just going to move, just leave the country and never come back. So now on my shoulders, I've, I've dealt with this knowing, you know, what happened in my own mind. I know, you know, he cold-blooded murdered somebody. And uh, I've dealt with this for, you know, going on two years now almost, you know. And I thought, okay, he's escaped the civil guys. They just don't, they can't get him. Or the criminal. Now he's just going to escape the civil guys. He's not going to pay them any money, which isn't enough anyway. You know, right. it's not enough to pay him back. But the guy's going to fly the country. So... He did this on a Wednesday, you know, he, he called me on a Wednesday to tell me this. So I had to make a decision, you know, it's that point in my life, I, I'm tired of running, you know, he, I'm, I don't want him to get away with it, you know, I don't know anything about the statute of limitations or, or what double jeopardy or anything, but I know there's always some sort of legal loophole you see on TV where a guy finally in the end gets away with it. So I said, if I don't come forward, you know, it's never going to be solved. Welcome back to the Lights Out Podcast. I am the MMA detective, Mike Davis. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the close of our multi-part series of the Gerald Strebent Raphael Tori Tory Murder and Deceit series. Um, in this episode, Gerald, we believe, is talking to the district attorney. In essence, he frames the story from beginning to end. When the district attorney hears it, he gives it a thumbs up, thumbs down. They bring it in front of a judge, and from there... An arrest warrant is issued. So we got these tapes. They, nothing was marked or labeled. Um, we edited and took what was salvageable. We really hope you guys enjoyed this series as much as we did. This is it. Like we've got other stuff, but it's it's really it's really kind of blah. So we hope you guys enjoyed this as much as we did. Like, share, and subscribe. You guys got to tell your friends about this channel. It's the only way we're going to grow. Thank you.